Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. You know, diodes have been around for a very long time. The first semiconductor diode was discovered in 1874 by the German scientist Carl Ferdinand Braun. Some years later, in 1894, a scientist from India used such a device to detect radio waves. But it wasn't until the 1950s that the semiconductor junction diodes that we have all come to know and love came into being. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the PN junction diode to give you some insight into how they work. Now, I'm not going to go into the deep down and technical descriptions that I had to endure in engineering school. The object of this video is to give you an appreciation for what goes on under the hood so that the videos that follow in this series will make sense to you. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So, to begin with, I have to talk about what they're made of. Well, the first diodes were made of germanium. These had certain advantages, but the disadvantages caused folks to look to other materials. Nowadays, nearly every diode has silicon as its base material. Two of the major reasons for moving to silicon were how it responds to temperature variations and cost. I mean, think of it. The major raw material for the silicon waiver used to create diodes is, well, sand just plain sand. And we have a whole bunch of this all over the planet. Now, silicon on its own is not a conductor, but it's not an insulator either. It is referred to as a semiconductor. So how do they make it into a conductor then? Well, to do this, they will purposely add impurities to pure silicon to make it into a conductor. This process is called doping. By doping the silicon with phosphorus, for instance, we create a material which now has free electrons which are available to carry current. This particular material is referred to as n-type material because these free electrons have a negative charge and they are what is referred to as the majority carriers of the material. By doping the silicon with boron, we create a material which now has electron-free positions, which are very happy to accept any electrons that wander by. These open positions in the material are called holes. This particular material is referred to as p-type material, because the majority carriers are those holes which represent a positive charge. Now, you will hear people talk about hole movement or injecting holes in the semiconductors, but unlike their electron counterpart, holes are not actually mobile because they are fixed to the atom that they're associated with, and the atom is fixed in the crystalline structure that makes up the semiconductor. What gives the appearance of movement are the electrons moving from hole to hole to hole through the material. Nonetheless, we can picture these holes as a moving entity for the sake of helping us to picture how things work. So what happens if we put some n-type material together with some p-type material. Well, the place where these two materials meet is referred to as the p-n junction. That's kind of pretty obvious. This is because this is where the p-type material and the n-type material come in contact with each other. So what happens at this junction? Well, the free electrons of the n-type material see the holes in the p-type material and want to fill them. And initially, the electrons flow across the junction into the p-type material to fill these holes. The region in proximity of the junction on one side now becomes negatively charged because of the electron movement. Meanwhile, 
On the other side of the junction, in the n-type material, the material becomes positively charged because, well, its electrons have flown off across the junction to fill holes. So on one side, we have a positive charge. On the other side, we have a negative charge. And that charge difference creates an electric field within the material itself. Eventually, the effects of the electric field come to an equilibrium with the forces that encourage the electrons to migrate and all electron movement ceases. This creates what is called the space charge region within the device. With this barrier in place, no current can flow. So, what good is that? Well, when we apply a voltage across this that opposes the internal electric field, we reduce the width of the space charge region. If this voltage increases sufficiently, then the space charge region width is essentially reduced to zero and current now flows through the device unabated. This condition is referred to as being forward biased. If we apply a voltage across this device that promotes this internal electric field, then the width of the space charge region increases and whatever conductivity that might have existed goes down. This condition is referred to as being reverse biased. The voltage that causes the device to conduct is called the forward voltage of the diode. In real-world semiconductor diodes, the forward voltage will change with the current through the diode, increasing with increasing current. Notice in the data sheet that the forward voltage specification is always given with the forward current at which the voltage was measured. Also in our real-world diode, the diode does not operate as a perfect insulator when it is reverse biased. Some current will always continue to flow. When you look at the data sheet, you will find this listed as the reverse leakage current of the diode. This value is often given in microamps at a particular voltage. If you increase this reversed voltage far enough, the device will break down in the opposite direction and begin conducting. This phenomenon is actually designed in to the Zener diodes which leverage this specific characteristic. The very basic model of a diode is with a resistor in series with our ideal diode. And then this whole assembly has a second resistor in parallel with it which represents the leakage current of the diode. Well, now we have an idea of how diodes do what they do. In the next video, I'm going to explain how the bipolar transistor does what it does. I've put a link to that video up in the corner for you. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.